icebreakers. I was laughing at that. It's amazing. You guys are incredible. You're incredible. Well, thank you so much for the honor to be with you all and to speak to you for a little bit. Um, there's nine gifts of the Spirit, and my question would be, when was the last time that you operated in one of the gifts of the Spirit? I want you to think about it. I'm not going to ask you the question. I'm not going to ask you a personal question. I just want you to think about it. When was the last time you operated in the gifts of the Spirit, and which one was it? Another question I want to ask you is, what gifts of the Spirit do you feel most comfortable in operating in? So think about that just for a little bit. Another question I would ask you is, are you able to operate in all of the gifts of the Spirit? There are nine gifts of the Spirit. We're going to go over them. Another question I want to ask you is, did you watch the videos that I put on Facebook on the gifts of the Spirit? If that, if you did, this will help you. The things I'm going to talk to you about today. If you have not watched them, then I would encourage you to watch them, and it will help you. So I wanted to put you a little bit of a head, a little bit ahead in this class, to help prepare you for what I was going to be talking about today. And so, very, very thankful for all of you, and excited about what God is doing in your life. At any time, if you have a question, or you would like to. Um, add anything or you have a comment please just raise your hand or throw one of those thumbs up on the screen and we'll get to you and so it's very important that i just don't talk to you but that we also are able to receive information and get things into our spirit to be able to use them for the glory of god so the gifts of the spirit are not to um are not to be able to show other people that hey i'm cool or, hey, look how, how important I am to God, or please accept me because I want to be accepted. All of these things are good. We want to be accepted by other people, but the gifts of the Spirit are not for that. The gifts of the Spirit are not for a show. It's not a circus. It's not to get attention from other people. So your motive for the gifts of the Spirit are very important. There are people that are greatly used of God, and then there are people that are used of God, maybe in more of a silent way. And if your motive is pure, you'll be used powerfully by God, whether in a loud way or whether in a quiet way. And so the important thing is your motive. And so uh, I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. I'm going to begin in verse 1. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. And so this begins to tell us about our motive. The motive behind the gifts of the Spirit is the love of God. The motives behind the gifts of the Spirit are to serve other people, and that's to give to other people and to love other people, and most of all, love God. So in the gifts of the Spirit, even this morning, I operated in the word of knowledge and the word of, word of wisdom this morning as I talked with God. And so your, the gifts of the Spirit are in operation your daily prayer walk with God. You can operate in all of the gifts of the Spirit in your daily walk with God. So some people think that operating the gifts of the Spirit is mystical, but I would say without the gifts of the Spirit, you probably don't have a deep walk with God. You're probably living off of somebody else's prayer walk. You're probably living off of the last service that you were in. So operating in the gifts of the Spirit on a daily basis is very important. And so that's the, that's the reason why I would ask you the question, when is the last time you operated in the gifts of the Spirit, and which gift was it? Are you able to operate in all of the gifts of the Spirit? It's nothing to boast about. It's just something to be aware of because it's very important that we broaden our walk with God and that we stay close to God and that understanding that operating the gifts of the Spirit is part of our relationship with God, which 
should be very exciting. It should be very exciting. You know, all these crazy movies are coming out with all this mysticism and all this. There's a lot of witchcraft out there, a lot of stuff that's being shown out there. And so that that's people's hunger to operate in the supernatural. That's simply people saying, hey, there's more out there for you. But that's the world. They're catching a hold of something that's happening in the spirit world around the world. And that is that people want more. And so I believe that that's why you're here today. Is it because you want more? You could be doing something else, uh, getting ready to go to bed or whatever, but you are, you're watching, you're, you're interacting and under, wanting to know more about the gifts of the spirit. So the Bible says love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. My love is rude sometimes. I just want to be honest with you. <laughs> it does not demand its own way. As we read these things and we look at ourselves in the mirror, we understand that, you know, we're not perfect. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't operate just like I'm showing you here. But if you can work on this every day so that the love of God is in your life, then the motive behind what you do for God will be right. So it does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. <clears throat> God's love is not irritable. This is very important. My love is irritable. I get irritated. And especially if I'm tired, I get irritated a little more easier than usual. And it keeps no record of being wrong. This is very important. Now, you may wonder what this has to do with the gifts of the Spirit, but let me just tell you, this is the backbone of the gifts of the Spirit. Because if you are keeping a being wrong, you're going to have a difficult time operating out of the correct motive for the gifts of the Spirit. You're going to want to prove that you are holy, prove that you are righteous, prove that you have knowledge and wisdom. And so if you keep a record of being wrong, you're going to continually find a way to prove that you're not wrong and you'll use the gifts of the spirit and you will manipulate God in order to vindicate yourself. And so being completely broken before God and having the love of God flow in your life and through you is very important in the operation of the gifts of the spirit. So it doesn't rejoice about injustice, but rejoice whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. So the gifts of the Spirit, the love of God, the gifts of the Spirit are to edify and to build the body of Christ. They're to build your walk with God. And if you desire the gifts of the Spirit for something else, then there's really a root problem in your life that you need to fix. And that has to do with relationship. So relationship is very important in operating in the gifts of the Spirit so that we have the love of God flowing through us freely. Before I ever speak, even before I came on, on here today, I asked God to give me his love for you. Here's the reason why. If I don't ask God for his love for you, then uh, I may get on here and I may be afraid to even talk to you. I'm 49 years old. I'm almost 50. I've been in ministry overseas for, this is my 27th, 27th year. My wife and I have helped to open up eight countries with the, uh, uh, getting the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ into them and starting churches all over the former Soviet Union. But still, I'm afraid to speak in front of people. That's my own carnality. My own basic love is afraid not to be accepted. And so this is human nature. How do you overcome that? You overcome that by asking God to baptize you with his divine nature. And his love, the Bible says, cast out all fear. So I'm not afraid to speak to one or two or hundreds or thousands of people. And I had the opportunity to speak to several thousand people. Before I ever got up there, I was so sick. I wanted to throw up. I wanted to get in my car and drive as fast as I could to get out of there. And uh, thank God my pastor came in there and laid hands on me in my, in my room before I was speaking. It was at general conference. And I was scared half to death, but I don't tell a lot of people that. 
but usually when you see somebody get up there, they look so confident and so full of Jesus, like they can do this every day. Believe me that our human nature is afraid. And what we need is we need the divine nature of God. And when we have the divine nature of God, absolutely anything is possible. And so I want to encourage you, the gifts of the Spirit are not simply pulpit ministry for pulpit ministry. The gifts of the Spirit are first and foremost for your daily walk with God. It's to love God with all your, uh, your heart, soul, and might. It's to love God with everything. We should desire the gifts of the Spirit first and foremost so that we can know God more. Second thing is we need to, to be able to have the gifts of the Spirit to be able to work together with God to help other people. And this is on a daily basis. Wherever we go, whether we're, we're, we're going to uh, the bank, whether we're going to the store, wherever we're at, we need to be able to help other people and love people. So if you don't have the love of God flowing in your life and through you, when you walk down the street, you're only going to be thinking about you. The love of God thinks about other people. And so this is one of the ways we know that the love of God is in our lives because we want other people to be blessed. We want other people to be strengthened. It's not about us shining. It's not about us being acceptable it's about other people being served by God. And so this is where we want to be yoked together with God so that we can help other people receive from God. If you go to service just so that you can receive something, then that's not the best motive. We go to the house of God to give. And if perhaps God gives something to us in that service, we thank God for that. But most of all, I, I get something from God on a daily basis in my relationship with God. This is where I hear from God. This is what I know what God is doing. And so when somebody comes up to me and gives me a word from God and says, hey, I have a word for you from God, if it doesn't connect with my spirit, they're off. Because in my relationship with God, he allows me to know what he is doing. And so it's very important to be able to have the gifts of the spirit in our life. So I want to read a passage. I believe one of the most I believe one of the most important gifts of the Spirit I want to be able to bring to your attention is what David talked to Solomon about. And I want to bring it to your attention. Um, I know the Bible says, uh, cover earnestly the best gifts. And so what are the best gifts? Whatever gift is needed. Whatever gift is needed at that moment, that is the best gift. It is said in the, in the Bible that the gifts of spirit, I mean, are given to each person um, basically according to their own ministry. That means you have a dominant uh, part of you, whether it's a militant character, you're going to operate more in the dynamics of the spirit. If it's more of a subdued character or personality where you're going to be more of an introvert, then you're going to operate in other gifts in a dominant way. And so there are... There are um, different gifts that you're going to specialize in. However, you can operate in all the gifts of the Spirit because the gifts of the Spirit are in the Spirit of God. So when I have received the Spirit of God, I have the potential to operate in all of the gifts of the Spirit. Simply, I have to understand how God, how He works, and then I can work together with God. So I want to give to you the the what I think are one of the most important gifts to be able to operate in. And I'm going to share with you the reason why in just a few moments. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, uh, verses 11 and 12, Now, my son, the Lord be with thee and prosper, uh, uh, and prosper thee and build the house of the Lord thy God as he has said of thee. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. And so this, this right here is really talking about the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. Later, Solomon goes through a situation where he asks the Lord to give him understanding, and this, this goes with discernment. So Solomon operated in, in three major gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discernment of spirits. These three major gifts. And David said, 
you need to get the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. One day the Lord told me, he asked me a question. He asked me a question about uh, what is the difference between knowing the will of God and the mind of God. And so uh, I gave him my answer. I, I, I talked to my wife first and asked her, <laughs> asked her some questions of what she thought it was. And I thought about it as well. And then I, I brought the Lord the answer. And uh, he didn't say I was wrong. But this is what he said. Knowing the will of God is the word of knowledge. Knowing, uh, knowing the mind of God is the word of wisdom. It's the details. So this is very important to be able to have in our lives. And that is the knowledge of God and the wisdom of God. Sometimes we get a, we're told, we're asked to go and preach a message somewhere, and it's a pulpit ministry or a youth conference or a youth service or a home group or something like that, and we ask God, God, give me a message for the people. And that's, we're asking God for a word of knowledge. And then we never ask God for a word of wisdom. God, what do you want to do as a result of this? What, how do you want to move upon the people? How do you want to impart this to the people? And so, so it's very important that we acquire the details of that message, not just a message so that whoever asked us feels good that we came and brought a word from God, but we want to know the mind of God. We also want to be able to discern by the Spirit of God. So it's very important to understand or to have the correct motive in operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Are there any questions so far? Is this understandable? Any questions? Yes. I, I have a question. Um, in reference to uh, knowing God, the knowledge of God and wisdom of God, you uh, mentioned in the videos that you asked us to watch before, the, the right side and left side. Could you talk about sort of how that applies to the, uh, the knowledge and wisdom aspect and if they have their own categories in that or if, uh, you know, they, they go into their own? <laughs> You're smiling, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is very good. Actually, I'm going to get into that in just a little bit, but I, let me answer that real quick. Word of knowledge and word of wisdom operate in your relationship or it operates in worship. So for example, I come into the presence of God. Um, I may start with thanksgiving and praise. I'm going to repent. I'm going to put off the old man uh, and I'm going to put on the new man. So um, these are some things that God taught me every day that you've got to get rid of the old nature. You've got to kill it. So I have a whole list of things that I have to kill on a daily basis because if the old mark gets uh, rises up, it's disastrous. So I crucify those things. I speak against those things. I bind them. I get rid of them. And I begin to put on the new man, etc. But after I do all this and I put on the whole armor of God, I, uh, um, I ask God also on a daily basis to develop me and teach me and mentor me in the gifts of the Spirit. Then I get into a place of worship, and it's in that wor place of worship, Dylan, that's where, that is where God can speak to me. He's not going to give me a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge and praise because it's an exuberant uh, action before God of celebrating but the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom comes through relationship, which is through worship, it's through intimacy. And uh, um, so we'll get into that in just a little bit. Also discernment of spirits, you can use discernment of spirits in a militant manner or in a relationship. So I'll get into some of that just uh, quickly. There are, there are a couple different ways that we communicate with each other. We communicate by word, Many times people think that God's just going to speak directly in their ear and do everything. But this is not true. Actually speaking, speaking, I mean, this is wonderful. It's good. But there are levels of trust in communication. And so the first level we get to is the word. But there are different ways that God communicates to us. He speaks to us. When God speaks to us, it's not an audible voice. He speaks directly into your spirit. And it actually sounds just like you. <laughs> and that's the crazy thing. 
finding out and discerning what is God and what is you. And just, just for your information, the devil's not going to tell you to go witness to somebody. When you're out in the streets, he's not going to tell you to go witness to somebody. So you can get the devil right out of there. Usually the devil is the last one to speak. God gives you something, and then you start analyzing it, and then you break it all apart. Then you become afraid. And by the time you get fear involved, then what happens is that's where the devil travels on. He travels on fear, not on faith. So if your faith is in God, Satan doesn't travel on that highway. But if you become afraid to operate, that's where Satan travels, and that's where you hear the voice of Satan clearly. But on the road of faith, that's where God operates. So uh, there are a couple different ways. So it's the spoke, someone speaking to you, that's a level of trust. You can, um, you can read a letter from somebody or get an email or get a text. That's another level of trust. Um, you, somebody can give you a letter to give to somebody else. That's another level of trust. And then there's body language. That's another level of trust. Then there are, uh, there's discernment. And that is a great level of trust. And so God's trying to get us to a place of trusting him. So he's not always going to speak directly into your spirit, although he should daily, but he uses other levels of trust in our relationship with him. There are times when I am praying and God gives me a, a glimpse in his spirit of something he wants to speak to me about. It, uh, just the other day, just a couple of days ago, I, ha I was struggling for two days to figure out some sort of structure I was working on. And so I was trying to figure this out and I was doing it on my own because I love to work with structure. God showed me a lot about structure. And so I was trying to figure it out on my own. I was going to show God how smart I am. And so I could not figure it out. And finally, I'm praying and God's like, hello, Mark, I, I want to help you. And I saw a vision, just a small, just a tiny glimpse of me writing on my whiteboard in my office. And, uh, and the moment this happened, I stood to my feet. I went over to the right board and I began to write and God gave me the entire thing. And so what can happen is in your relationship, God just, it's like, he just simply passes by and lightly touches you. And so what happens is we many times uh, miss what God is trying to say to us because we're so busy about our own relationships, our own problems, our own desires, that we miss what God is doing. And so God wants to reveal to us the secret things of God. But it comes through relationship and the slight touch of his spirit as he passes by. He may only ask once. <laughs> but it's very important to be able to be sensitive to God. So uh, that's a little bit of visual. To, to have a vision from God is really the prophetic. And so uh, in the word of the Lord in the Old Testament, prophets were first called seers, and that's the ability to see in the Spirit. Anybody, if you have the Holy Spirit, you can see in the Spirit. But this is different levels of trust. First, you have to recognize discernment of spirits. You have to be able to discern the Spirit of God. And so sometimes what God does a lot is he allows you to discern something that something is off or that he's trying to do something. And if you will pay attention, then he will show you a highway or he will show you a road or he will show you a path that he wants you to continue to walk on and that you would inquire of God, asking of God for knowledge about the situation or knowledge about the uh, subject and then ask him for the details of it. And so this is God wanting us to pursue relationship. It's not about being great in the gifts of the Spirit. It's not about people accepting us. It's about God 
in, in us, our relationship with God. And so this is very important in the gifts of the Spirit. You can operate in all of the gifts of the Spirit, and you should. And if you can, if you can work with God and get rid of fear, then wherever you go, you can make a huge impact as you work together with God and see the glory of God. So let me, uh, let me just show you, um, there's three different categories that I would bring out in the gifts of the Spirit. You have one is the silent gifts, another one is utterance gifts, another one is power gifts. All of these categories are important. So you have uh, silent gifts are going to be the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discernment of spirits. You have utterance gifts, which are tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of prophecy. You also have power gifts, which is gifts of healing, gift of faith, and working of miracles. And so we're going to discuss these a little bit. Also, I'm going to show you where these gifts operate because it's very important understanding how these gifts operate so it takes the fear out of us or the confusion or the panic or the anxiety out of our spirits so that we can operate together with God. Any questions so far? Any comments? Really quick. You said it was uh, silence gifts, utterance gifts, and what was the last one? I missed it. Power Sorry. gifts. Power gifts. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So... Here are some natural things. If you're an introvert, you're probably going to desire knowledge and wisdom and discernment. You're going to want to be protected. If you're an extrovert, you're probably going to want to operate in power. If you have damaged relationship, uh, then it can change and, and it can confuse the whole thing that you have in your spirit of your desires. But the really basics of who you are are very important, that you need to be able to identify you. Most people are, are uh, they go on in life, never truly find out who they are. So this is very important. The basics of this is understanding who you are, and then you can understand what gifts are going to come easily to you. So let me just show you a couple of things real quick, and then I'm going to get into right hand, left hand, or worship and praise and where the gifts of the Spirit operate. So your identity is very, very important. So for example, there are three basic um, uh there are three basic operations that I would like to bring to your attention. And that is, let me show it from Satan's side, and then I will show it from God's side, because we will all recognize uh, uh, the word of the Lord for, the Bible says, all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. What does that really mean? Pride speaks of headship. So whenever you're thinking about, uh, like Old Testament structure, you're thinking about Moses, you're thinking about headship. He hears from God, speaks for God. He's got close relationship with God. So he deals with vision. That means where are we going? He deals with structure. That means structuring everything, organizing everything. Uh, he also deals with goals, the next steps that we have to take in order to reach vision. And that's headship. So uh, another thing that's in the world is the lust of the eye. It's to conquer. Now, Satan mimics God. So if you look in the Old Testament, you see uh, Moses as the head. Joshua is the conqueror. And this is right hand. So it's right hand power. And so um, you may be somebody that... Uh, you, you desire the power of God, the demonstration of God. You always want to see people healed. You want to speak faith. You're optimistic. And so you have, your identity is going to be militant. You like to jump. You like to praise God. You are a militant person. You love to, you don't like it when people speak negative. And so you are optimistic. Uh, so um, you may be, uh, that would be a right-hand person. 
if you're one that you're always thinking about vision, where are we going? Why don't people communicate? Why is there no structure? Why is there no organization? Well, that's headship. Uh, the other thing I want to bring out is um, is the lust of the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is perversion. Simply, what that is is truth is a correct way. Perversion is a twisted way. So, truth that is twisted is perversion. So, um, in the Old Testament, you have Moses as the head. You have Joshua as the right hand. You have the left hand as Aaron. Aaron was a judge. He had to know the word of God as the high priest. So you have this great balance of if I take a bow and arrow, with my right hand I pull back, which is power. With left hand I guide. And so uh, you have power, which is right hand. Law is the thing that guides you on the straight and narrow. And so this is very important. So you, if you are somebody that just loves pronunciation, like for example, when my wife and I go down the road and we're, I read signs like uh, on billboards, <laughs> I like to mess up the words. And my wife just does not like it. And she will always correct me. And so it's like I have this little boy inside of me that's very mischievous. And so I like to do that because my wife is dominant left. She is a word person. Uh, she, wa she wants to hear pronunciations correctly. She wants to know that you're quoting the scriptures correctly. Um, uh, so that's a, that's a person that's left side dominant. That's a, that's a judge. That is, a, um, that is somebody that loves intimacy. That's an introvert. So some people say, hey, you're too introvert. You need to be extrovert. Well, maybe your dominant side is an introvert, and that's how God created you. Well, you should also try to be optimistic at the same time and try to be an extrovert in some ways, but understand your personality and how God created you because that's where you're going to feel more, most comfortable in operating in the gifts of the Spirit. So my wife is dominant left so she operates very quickly in the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge and so before she, when she operated in the word of wisdom word of knowledge i didn't want to tell her because uh because i myself didn't have the information all of a sudden she had it and i didn't want her to get the big head <laughs> that's probably not very good but anyways but she's dominant left so there are uh there's also another level which is management and that is to manage the things of god but uh really these are the top three that we can look at all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh lust of the eye and the pride of life but in the kingdom of god the pride of life is based off of your humility which is brokenness so if you're a person that loves vision you have to be broken before god you have to make sure you maintain brokenness and that you have meekness. Moses was a visionary, a man that had vision from God. He had the ability to see, and he had to have meekness. So what you have to really develop as a person that, person that likes vision, structure, goals, you have to develop meekness. Meekness is the love of God. That's what we, that's what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the love of God, the ability to lift other people up higher than yourself. If you are a person that is dominant right, then you have to make sure you're, you're wanting to operate in the power of God. You have to make sure you balance it with intimacy with God. These things are very important because you have to understand who you are and your identity. And so you have to you have to balance it with the opposite. If you're, an, if you're an introvert and it's all about the correct pronunciation and all of this kind of stuff, what can happen is you can, if you get off balance in it, you can become judgmental. Now you're always judging people, measuring them by the law, by the word. And what you have to do is you have to go to a place of loving people making sure that your intimacy with God and the righteousness that you desire to be always correct in people, 
that you operate in mercy. And so mercy is going to be more on the right side. Now, you can be off balance on the right side of power. And how you know somebody is off balance when they're operating power all the time is the law of God doesn't mean so much to them anymore. They say we're free from the law. And you have to be careful that you don't become off balance. So if you are, if you are militant and you start saying the, the law of God's not so important anymore, then you're off balance. If you are on the left side, you're a person that's an introvert and you're being judgmental, that's you're off balance. You have to have mercy. Mercy rejoices over judgment. And so you have to have a balance in this understanding who you are. If you're, a, if you're an extrovert and you always like praise, 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 power, 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 you have to balance it with a secret time with God with worship. If you're all about worship, 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 intimacy with God, law of God, then you balance it with praise. And so another way to look at it is, love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, and might. That's your intimacy with God. That's the left hand. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the right hand. And so uh, this is very important to understand a balance and understand you. So we want to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, but it's very important to understand your identity. So if you're ahead, then it's going to be vision, structure. Um, it's going to be uh, organization. It's going to be goals. If you're going to be right hand, it's about power, 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 because you're a conqueror. If it's going to be left then it's going to be about the structure of word, the word, the righteousness, all of these kinds of things. You're going to be more introverted. And these things are good. These are good. You simply have to understand who you are and use what God has given you to bring honor to his kingdom. So it's very important to understand where you fit in the body of Christ. Don't let the devil pervert it. So let's understand who we are in Christ Jesus. So really quick, does anybody have a question, comment? Yeah, I, uh, as you were talking, I just thought they that worship in must worship in spirit and in truth. Would you say it's sort of that balance between spirit and truth, like right hand, left hand sort of thing? You are very good, my friend. Yes, that's exactly right. So you have balance. Uh, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. That's power and truth. So Revelation 1 and 6 says, We are kings and priests unto God. Kingship is authority. Priest is that left hand. And so throughout the word of God, we see this incredible balance. Did you know that every structure globally is going to have both right hand and left hand and headship? Even uh, even the United States of America, which is actually uh, the structure and the organization of it, come from the Republic of Rome. Study it out. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, and when you, when you study it out, of course, you look at this, the organizational structure of the United States of America. It has military. It has, uh, it has law. And it has headship. Because any body structure does. And so we need to be able to understand uh, right hand, left hand, headship, and to understand what God is doing, understand the way God is going, work together with God. So any of the gifts of the Spirit, it's very important to understand the gifts of the Spirit operate not 100% of the time in your life. They operate when the Spirit of God is upon you. So you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Yes, Nikki. Just wondering if you could um, go farther into detail about the difference between worship and praise. Yes, 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 absolutely, I will. Okay, so, <laughs> Mike, this is, this is wonderful. I love them. You guys are amazing. Yes, worship, <laughs> worship in Hebrew is shaka. It actually means to bow in obeisance to. So like if you're coming up to a king, you're in a new territory, you come up to a king, you would bow. And the statement you are making is, 
I submit to your law. I'm in your territory, I recognize you, I submit to your territory. So it's placing yourself in an intimate place where they can literally take off your head. So uh, worship has to do with reverence. It has to do with that intimacy with God. It's, a, um, it's the secret place of God. It's in the secret place of God where you get knowledge, you get wisdom, uh, you get understanding of what God is doing. Um, and so this is that intimate place, and this is worship. Now, praise is one of, the, one of the words that's used the most for praise is halal in Hebrew. And it simply means to celebrate. So like, for example, uh, we could be at service and we shouted, we danced and we rejoiced and we didn't have any worship, but we had a lot of praise. We had a lot of power. We had a lot of demonstration. Praise on its own will not change your life. Intimacy will. Praise on its own will not save you. Worship will. Worship has a way of developing your character. So we could say, oh man, we, we had great service tonight. I spoke in tongues, I shouted, I danced, but you never changed. Your character did not change. You felt, you felt power. It's in power where you conquer. So you have to understand that it's not just about conquering, pushing back the devil. Pushing back the devil does not save you. It does help you. But it's your intimacy with God, the secret place of God that will save you. And so these things are very important in praise and in worship. One is right hand. One is intimacy. And so praise and worship. Any comments, thoughts? I had a quick comment. Yes. This is all very mind-blowing and amazing. That's all my comment is. <laughs> so sometimes we have, we, we're going to have service and we say, oh, we're going to have a great time. Let's have, let's have some praise and worship. Well, we just use two different words in Hebrew. So have you ever been in a, uh, in a service where something just seemed to be off? It's like we're trying to worship, we're trying to have intimacy with God, but it's just not going well. Something just is like, it's like somebody scratching on a chalkboard. Something is irritating your spirit. What is it? It's because you enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. So before you can truly get to intimacy with God, you have to push back demonic powers, which always comes by praise. And so if you try to get to worship without pushing back demonic powers, then your worship will be hindered. And so you are, you, are, you are discerning in the spirit that something is not right. What's not, it's not that worship is not right. It's that you haven't pushed back demonic powers. So the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of Israel. In other words, he sets up his throne. He puts dominion through praise. And if you haven't set up dominion yet and you want to get to worship, it's going to feel off. And so it's simply discerning. When you are discerning something's off, something's off. <laughs> That's how simple it is. <laughs> so, for example, oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. Uh, if I'm talking to somebody and I feel... I feel uh, unacceptable to them. If I feel, um, if I am discerning that, that I'm not good enough, uh, what happens is that person is dealing with low self-esteem. They're therefore projecting judgmentalism to you so that they can feel better about themselves and you are discerning there's no connection. That's called discernment. But what happens is you leave feeling inadequate. That's not because you're inadequate. It's because that person is dealing with something in their life and they're projecting that to you. 
So true brokenness and the divine nature of God, this is so that the divine nature of God can work. The divine nature of God accepts you regardless. Now the divine nature of God doesn't leave you in a sinful state. The divine nature of God will lead you to purity and holiness and godliness, but it never is judgmental or condemning. So if I'm speaking to somebody and I feel a quick connection, it's because they are giving me access to their spirit so that we can have relationship. Then you have to be also careful that that person has a relationship with God, because if they don't, you may feel a quick connection, but it may be deception. They may be saying, hey, my heart is open to you. You've got to by the spirit of God if they're from God or not. Does that make sense? So simply because you have a connection with somebody doesn't mean they're godly. It simply means you have access to my heart. Make sense? Um, 